Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So hi everyone, my name is Sarah Schuen and I'm the Accounting Associate at Enterprise Works and Program Coordinator for Path to the Park. I would like to welcome you all to our second diversity and inclusion conversation. Today we have Eric Crawford, Senior Software Developer at John Deere, speaking with us about his continuing journey to success. Eric recently received his Bachelor of Science from the University of Illinois Springfield and has agreed to speak with us today about his personal experiences with diversity and inclusion throughout his career, as well as giving us an inside look at what everyday life is like working at John Deere within the research park. Feel free to drop your LinkedIn in the chat box and raise your hand or put a question in the chat if you have any for Eric. When asking your questions, please come off mute to make things a little bit more, in quotes, I would say, lifelike, <laughs> and so that Eric can see all your beautiful faces. I'm gonna stop talking now because you all hear enough from me. Eric, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction. Um, just a side note, I don't do slides, so don't expect me to present anything. I like to just go off the cuff and talk directly to people and be upfront as I can. Um, if you all have any questions, I completely open the questions while talking during conversations or at the end, however feels more comfortable for you all. Uh, feel free to jump in whenever and however you want to. Um, I think what I'm gonna do actually is kind of just give a history of my journey from, I guess, high school up to now. So I took a pretty um, undirect journey to where I'm at right now. Not as smart as any of you all on this phone, <laughs> on this call. Uh, but uh, I learned along the way that hard work pays uh, and kind of went the backwards route to get, get where I was at. So um, with that, uh, I'm hi, Eric Crawford, John Deere, senior software developer, born and raised in Chicago, um, left Chicago around 2000 to go to SIU Carbondale for uh, computer, not computer science, electrical engineering. That was my love at the time. And while there, I uh, actually changed to computer science. However, while I was in school, school was not really my focus. I was more interested in, you know, partying and having fun. You know, we're at SIU, it's a party school during the time. So uh, actually did not finish school uh, back then. I actually ended up going to Johnny Logan, which is a community college and got an associate's in computer science uh, around 2005, 2006. So, you know, five, six years of paying for college only to a uh, associate's degree. Uh, was not a promising good start. So after I finished with Johnny Logan, I went out to the workforce, the real world, and you know, learned how to live. <laughs> uh, I stayed in Carbondale for about 15 years doing ins and outs. Um, started at Best Buy as a uh, inventory specialist and I moved over to the Geek Squad where I spent a good chunk of my career before coming here. Um, did the in the store computer stuff that I got out to driving the book where I was going to people's homes and fixing their computers and also did remote computer work where I was able to work from home and get on people's computers remotely. That job actually is where I first began learning about hard work, believe it or not. Uh, while I was out driving and meeting a lot of people, one of the historic things in my life that I like to go back to is, you know, just being able to communicate with other people and people from all walks of life. Uh, not just people that you know in your own background, but people that you never even know, people from other countries and stuff. You learn a lot just talking to other people and their struggles and stuff like that and how they overcome um, situations. So I think through tutelage of not even knowing that people was telling me, hey, this is how you need to succeed. You know, a lot of people would give me suggestions and stuff in life. And at that time I was, I would listen, I would hear them, but I wasn't really listening. And it wasn't until a little bit later where work was getting really strenuous where I started to think about, okay, I need to change my life. I need to do something different. So um, on the side, I also was doing real estate. I did uh, have a real estate company. I started uh, did property management down in Carbondale for like two or three years. It was fun, but wasn't rewarding. Um, I always like software programming and always want to get back to software. So uh, around this time, I decided to quit the real estate stuff and start really focusing on my life. What do I need to do to get better? Best Buy was getting to the point where I was working 12 hours a day because they was, you know, slimming, you know, put more work on one person and, you know, wake up at nine o'clock, go to bed at or get off of work at 7 p.m. and repeat the whole thing it was getting monotonous and old. So I wanted to do something different. 
at this time, mobile was starting to go big, mobile app development, doing iOS and stuff. This is about 2008, 2009. Um, in Carbondale, there really wasn't nothing for people that wanted to learn mobile development, especially, you know, somebody like me, you know, <laughs> a guy of my complexity and stuff. So I started looking around to see where near me can I go and network with other like-minded people or other people just trying to do something in mobile. And the nearest place happened to be Champaign, Illinois. And it just so happened that around the time I was looking, the research park that you all are gladly a part of, <laughs> they're always doing great things, uh, was having this thing called Mobile Developer Day which was their first event to actually bring mobile developers together in central Illinois. So all Champaign, Urbana, and a whole bunch of other cities around this area, they were just trying to gather all the mobile developer knowledge and bring us together to kind of just discuss our, you know, how to go forward in this thing and how to improve. So I applied and came up here, you know, three hour journey from Carbondale to Champaign for that event. And as part of that event, uh, they actually were also planning to start classes. And the way they did the classes was, was beautiful, it was sweet. And Laura and them at the time, I guess, didn't understand how sweet they laid it out. But what they had did was uh, they charged the students $100 to get into the class, which is nothing for a class to learn mobile development. That's pennies. But then on the other side, they would charge companies like $2,000 or $3,000 to have access to all of the students. So you can turn around and say, hey, we can allow you to have, you know, four to five mobile developers working on your prototype idea, which was beautiful. So a good entryway to allow lower um, income people into this new market of mobile development and also give us experience and uh, put us in front of real companies, which was beautiful. And I applied not knowing that I would get it, you know, I'm from Carbondale, they asked for your address, I'm like, who's this guy coming way down from Carbondale up here, that's not gonna work, but they accept me. And so I had a real hard decision to make, you know, how do I come up to Champaign twice a week, because the click class was two or three times a week and, you know, take this opportunity. And so I had to, you know, do what most people were scared to do and that is make sacrifices. So I decided on my days off, I, would, I switched my days off at work to be the days of the class. And I would get up at six o'clock in the morning on these two days, I need to come up here, take Amtrak up here, spend the day up here, have the class at night and immediately jump off Amtrak to go back home. So I did this for the whole summer, probably like three or four months, coming up here for the class and going back and then getting to work and kind of just pushing myself to learn something new. Uh, one good side effect of that is traveling. You know, that three hours here and back, there's no distractions. Um, internet is pretty much out most of the way, so you have nothing else to do but to read. And I think that helped me a lot in actually picking up on my mobile development skills a lot quicker. At the end of the class, uh, I turned out to be one of the uh, top tier uh, guys in the class. I guess I had all this time to just learn and pick up stuff. So um, some of the outputs that we had to do as part of the end of the class was to actually uh, present our prototypes to the companies that we were representing. And our group was the only group that actually had a real iPad app that worked that we was able to present. Like most of the other groups, they just did PowerPoints on it and mock-ups on how things would work, but we actually presented a real mock-up. Um, and it was really good. A lot of people liked it. Uh, the company definitely liked it. And after the class, I actually reached out to the company that we had did this for to see if they would like us to continue. Uh, in which case they did take us on to do that. So uh, a lot of determination, a lot of sacrifices in my own time to actually get to that point, but that led to my next journey in life, which was here at Deer. So that company that we had wrote the app for just happened to be a company that was right above John Deere. And John Deere at the time was looking for mobile app developers. They haven't done mobile apps before. They probably had like one in the app store that was done by a third party supplier, but they wanted to actually bring internal developers in and actually really grow this capacity inside of John Deere. And so just by luck, the person upstairs was talking to the people downstairs and my name got thrown around and they reached out to me like, hey, you're looking for mobile developers we've seen your work we like you want to know if you're interested in this and at the time i really wasn't interested 
Um, I really was thinking about starting my own company and like building apps on the side and stuff for people. Uh, but I was, I was tired of Best Buy so much, I took the opportunity. I was like, okay, yes, let's do this. Um, and just as a side note of this, this taking this opportunity is the pivot in my life that changed me from making, you know, $17, $18 an hour to almost triple that. So associate's degree, a lot of hard work traveling back and forth allowed me to pivot my lifestyle and to move forward. Now that I'm at Deer, I took the opportunity to kind of step back and reset my life with other things that I should have done in the past and trying to catch back up. So as, um, as the host pointed out, I did get my bachelor's degree, but that is like recent. Like I just graduated last year from that. Uh, I have recently um, decided to go back to school again and get my master's in computer science, but I'm specializing in data science on top of that also. Uh, there's a few things I want to learn. I, I love learning now. Um, there's a few new skill sets that I want to bring into and kind of merge with mobile development or actually just probably leave out of mobile development and give it to something else altogether. But always continue growing the skill sets and make sure that I can sell myself um, to any company, any place that I decide to be. So uh, that is uh, pretty much my story, uh, at least the important parts that I think you all are interested in. <laughs> Uh, I didn't want to take a lot of time up on me. I really want to hear questions from you all also um, or anything that, that interests you. Um, it, I didn't speak too much about diversity. My, my whole take on diversity and inclusion is we, we, we have to start with ourselves first on that. You can't just expect other people to come around and be inclusive and expect you to bring you in. You got to actually put yourself out there and say, hey, I, I want to do this. And that's kind of where I take that stance on diversity and inclusion. Um, Deer is very, 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 very diverse. And uh, they have a lot of drive drivers for inclusion. Um, as part of my field, I actually work with uh, a lot of STEM groups. So I help out with the younger schools and stuff for uh, robotics, first and a couple of other things we do just we go out to high schools and grammar schools to kind of teach kids what John Deere does but at the same time we're reaching into schools where there's low big amounts of low-income students uh, people like myself that don't know that we can do these things and just letting them hey I'm like you and I can do these things so you should be able to do these things also there's no problem in doing this you just gotta step up and put yourself out there and learn and work hard at it so uh, with that I'm gonna pause, take a drink of water, let you all <laughs> throw some questions at me. Um, and yeah, door's open. Eric, um, it's interesting um, that you say, you know, when you go and, and speak to these students and you say, you know, you can, you can be able to do everything that I've done. And I think that, you know, having you here today, you could really be that person for a lot of the students on this call. So is there anybody that, um, you saw when you were younger and you said, you know, I want to be just like him or her and um, really inspired you to make those sacrifices and take the next step and um, really just decide to work really hard to, to be where you are today. At that time, no, it was really more of a driver. Like I'm sick of my life. That was the real push. However, now in my current life, I do look back at our historical figures for inspiration. So uh, I just finished reading Booker T. Washington's autobiography. And that is like, like if, if nobody hit it, if anybody hit it bad, he hit it bad. Like when he was trying to start the Tuskegee Institute, he was telling this story about, um, he first, he always wanted to learn, like he, slavery had just ended and he was trying to actually get into a school to get an education. And he traveled to, I forget the name of the, the city he went to, um, to try to get to school and there was no places where he could stay. So the first couple of weeks of school, he actually was living up under a bottom, but he wanted his education so bad, that was a sacrifice he was willing to make to do that. And that's the type of stuff that inspired me, just seeing you know, real struggles and real solutions to get it around them, those struggles. And that's what inspires me more today. Yeah, thank you so much for that, that's awesome. If any of our mentees wanna ask questions, we have two on the call with us today, not to call you guys out or anything, but... Um... Please feel free to ask a question. Um, just come off mute and ask your question or post it in the chat. 
Or any questions I just brought up the chat. Well, nothing in the chat yet, I guess. I can go ahead and start us off while the mentees think of a question. Um, thank you for being here today. I'm Yazra. I am Jeanette's student mentor. And I know you mentioned briefly the sacrifices you had to make and um, how that was difficult, but ultimately got you where you were. Can you talk a bit more about how those challenges maybe helped you in the recruiting process or how like your background as a diverse candidate was used to your advantage or like how you leverage that? Because I know there are, especially in the corporate world, lots of obstacles that diverse candidates, especially like first generation college students or like me as a student athlete um, that we have to like face. Can you talk a bit about that? Absolutely. I, I believe one of the biggest pain points that I see with, with a lot of people of my color at least is that we're, we're programmed a lot of times that you can't really do a lot of this stuff. And so as candidates come in, the first thing I do, if they're like all oh, with a suit and tie and stuff, you know, the, the natural thing you would especially, I'm like, take the tie off, relax, want some water. We, we don't talk business until like five or 10 minutes later after they've relaxed, after they cool down. I tell them, you know, this is going to be the most informal interview you've ever been in. And I want you to be open with me, fresh with me, and, you know, try to relate. You got to relate on the same level before you do anything. Because you got to take the nervousness out. Because a lot of times there, there's a thinking, I'm going to be thrust into this world that I'm not used to. And you want to comfort them and be like, no, you won't be. We will always have support here. And then just speak to them like a human being. And so my... What I've been through has kind of helped me realize a good way of communicating with others and just kind of woo <laughs> calm down and let's go through this on a calmer, calmer level. Yeah, to piggyback off of that, um, I mean, my first uh, time meeting you, I definitely felt like our conversation was both of us really bringing our true selves to the conversation, having a really authentic um, conversation. And I definitely see that you wear that on your chest every day. You wanna be your most true and authentic self. So um, for those of us that may be a little bit nervous to bring our true and authentic self to work or to class every day, um, what kind of advice do you have? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> um, that's kind of tough because in today's world, you're, you're, you really see everybody's putting up their fake front, like on oh, you go on Facebook and everything, everything, there's nobody really 100% true in their photos and everything. You want to put your face, your best face forward. Um, I think you've asked a question that, that stumps me because I, I really don't have a good answer to how you would do that. Uh, the, the common knowledge would be just be yourself and be respectful of how others are seeing you and how you want to be presented to others and not like in a highlight like you're all this and almighty but just you know this is me i am who i am um if you don't like me oh well and i, I guess that's probably it like you don't try to force yourself to fit into some place that you know you're not wanting that's only going to create more issues in the long run and stuff but you know there's always a place for you if somebody doesn't like you that's their loss, not your loss, to be yourself. Absolutely. That's that's the best answer I think you could have provided. And <laughs> that really reminds me of, you know, being an athlete, being an ex-athlete. You're obviously not, everyone on the team's not going to like you. And, you know, what are you going to do? You have to deal with them every day, right? Yeah. Sometimes, you know, Mia knows sometimes for 12 hours a day or how many hours a day that you're with them, um, you just kind of have to suck it up and deal with it and find a way to cope. Um, so, you know, since we're on the topic of athletics and Mia, you know, I'm going to call you out on this one, but please go ahead and ask um, Eric a question. I know you have some good ones. Hey, hold on. Before, before you ask, one, one thing I, I do want to say, I think I'm able, I'm a little naive in life right now too, because I don't really, I don't care what people think about me per se. Like, uh, I would go out wearing jeans with holes in them, or, you know, if I need to go to some place where I'm supposed to be looking presentable and not, I, I, I really don't care what people say. So it allows me to kind of go through life with a lot less stress and a lot less worries because if you know, somebody don't like me, I'll just go on to the next person. Keep moving. There's somebody out there that's going to be able to help you do something that you want to do and help you move forward. You just got to get the bad people out the way quickly so you can get on to the good stuff. Um, hi, I'm Mia. I am one of the mentees. But um, yeah, thank you for sharing your experience. It's been really great to hear. Um, I guess I was just wondering, 
now that you're in a position, I think that you've, you've talked about being really passionate about and um, being in a better position in, in life now, what made you motivated to go back to get a, a bachelor's degree and to now to go get your master's? What keeps motivating you for that? The, I waste the, I'm, I'm old, I'm 40 years old <laughs> right now. I mean, I look like, but I'm, I'm 40. And I feel like uh, I wasted a lot of my life partying. And back in the day when I should have been focused on school, should have been doing things the right way. So going back to get my bachelor was more so me just doing things right. Like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Repurposing for past sins, essentially. Um, I didn't really need the bachelor's degree. Where I'm at at Deer right now and in my skill set, I'm very confident that I can always go and get a job. I can always, I will always be employed. I'll always be self-sufficient. So the degree was really just, here's a paper that says I was able to do this. In my respect, I mean, a lot of people do need that paper to receive, but I know I didn't. Now, the master's that I'm going for now, I'm actually kind of the same thing. I don't really need the paper, but what I want is the knowledge that this degree is going to give me. Um, I have a need to always want to know, be able to read and decipher information. You know, you get all these news articles and stuff that says, you know, X amount of people say why, or you got, you know, 100% of Americans say this, but a lot of times the data may not say that. It may be skewed or so skewed that it says something different, but they took a little piece out and told you only the parts that they wanted you to hear. And what I want to be able to do is be able to have a skill set that can actually go and read that same amount of data and very quickly pull out insight. And so the data science aspect of a degree that I'm learning is really what's going to help me do that. The paper part that I'm getting for the degree is just icing on the cake. I mean, I could go and learn data science and stuff myself, but I'm going to do this, might as well get something else out of it also. Does anybody have another question before I start asking my questions? Because I have a lot. <laughs> yeah, um, I have a question. Um, so I'm Jeanette, I'm one of the mentees, and I'm kind of like in the process of learning more about interview tips and that type of thing. So I was just kind of wondering, like, is there like a way you recommend using your background to your advantage during the recruiting process or like even in an interview? Yeah, yeah. Well, not in an interview, but I would definitely say go out to the schools and the underprivileged places that you know you can benefit the most. Because uh, nine times out of 10, there are students there that don't think that they can do what you can do. They don't know that there's people out there like you. Um, I, I really believe there are issues with the amount of you know, diversity and inclusion in the workplace and stuff really starts at the school level. I don't think it's really heavily dependent on the companies and corporations, even though there are issues there, but I think the, the bulk of it, 60 to 70% of the issue starts with the schools not really pushing kids in these directions. Um, for me here at Deer, um, when I was hiring for mobile, I probably got out of, obviously out of a thousand applications total, 10 that were African-American. Even with the recruiting in NSB and everything that we went and did purposely to try to get more, the amount of people that actually just applied wasn't as high as what we thought they would be. And so there's that issue there with like how many people actually really has the skill set of what we're looking for that's in this diverse region of what we're looking for also. And that's a little bit tough. So we want to go out there and kind of have the next generation of kids inspire to do all these other things, not just as, you know, play basketball or stuff like that. So nothing's wrong with sports, but what I'm saying we, we gotta expand the horizon. We can't have everybody going down this one narrow path. There's a wide world out there to explore. You are definitely preaching to the choir there, Eric. <laughs> I'm, I'm all about telling the athletes that there is more than, you know, the NFL or the NBA or whatever, you know, you need to have a plan B. That's definitely what um, at a big 10 school um, is a little bit difficult to get in, into the brains of these young athletes at times. So that's definitely something that is so true to my heart. And um, I think Mia being here is just speaks volumes to that as well. She really is working hard to um, better herself, you know, off the beam, I suppose, since she's in gymnastics. Um, so Eric, I know that you mentioned, you said you got like 10 black or African-American 
applications. Do you think that there were more and people were choosing not to, you know, check the box? And why do you think they would have done that? Yeah, I definitely think there were more because I know when we went to, I'm, I'm also, I'm not wearing no sweater yet, but I'm also one of the representatives for the Third Grade Marshall College Fund. So when we, we represent them also do scholarships and stuff. And I go and speak to colleges student, college students and stuff at the historically black colleges about, you know, deer and stuff. So I know we're getting the name out there. We're getting the information out there. Um, but I think at the same time, deer, not a lot of times, but deer has a, re a representation of being, uh, you know, we're, our headquarters is in Moline, Illinois. We're not on the East Coast, not on the West Coast. We're not someplace fun where you want to be. Um, so that's that's one strike against us. Two, we are historically farm. Like from Chicago, I thought John Deere was just some tractor company, which means there's not too many people like me that's going to be working at this type of company. So some of it is advertising. Some of it is just, you know, perception, what people think. Um, and that's why myself and there's a lot more like me and they're just trying to get out there to all these schools to kind of just change their perception and let you know like hey there are opportunities for us here also we just need you to apply <laughs> <laughs> but that's john Deere. i can't really speak for other companies it may be similar things for why other companies may have issues bringing in more diverse talent uh, but that's our thing here there more questions or was there more to that what i supposed to ask was there two questions or I think there was just one. I think you answered oh. it perfectly. You're good. <laughs> Does anybody else other than me have some more questions that you guys want to either pop in the chat or come off mute and, and talk to Eric a little bit? I will also throw this out there. If any of you all are shy right now or talking, I, I do take emails, messages, take, take them all. You can <laughs> test me on LinkedIn, shoot me an email. I post my email here in the chat. I, I'm completely open. Well, I guess since we're on the topic of John Deere, um, tell us a little bit more about what John Deere values most in an intern, and then um, what should uh, a new app applicant, I suppose, um, do when they are really interested in John Deere? You know, when should you apply? What's most important to come into an interview with? I know you say your interviews are very uh, more on the casual side, really want to connect with a, an applicant. Um, yeah, what advice do you have if some of our mentors or mentees want to join John Deere in the future? That's a good question. So I'm, I'm kind of struggling to spread a better interview um, culture around here because a lot of the people here that interview is, is HR-ish. Like you got to have your T's crossed and your I's dotted and stuff like that. Um, it's intimidating at times. And even with my interviews, even though I do keep it calm, there is things that I have to follow and policies that I have no choice to do, which is kind of intimidating also. Um, so initially, first and foremost, just people that want to apply dear, know your, whatever you feel you're applying for, make sure you know it inside and out. Uh, I know you're still in college uh, or students are still in college, you're just getting out. But you know, if you, if you say you know data sciences, you better know the terms you better be able to speak off some, some algorithms and stuff like that. Uh, definitely know your stuff really good. Be able to communicate. That's always key because we do have questions that will put you in tight situations during the interviews that like give you examples of, you know, here's a situation, what would you do? And most of those are really, really, you know, interesting situations to be in. And diversity is definitely a part of all of those you know, cultural differences. Uh, you got to be able to handle those types of situations. So know your stuff, know how to handle tough situations and be prepared to like answer those types of questions in an interview. That would be my top two. Oh, in terms of kind of practicing and getting to know John Deere's, I would suppose usual interview questions or things that you really should know. Um, how should they go about um, making those connections with people, you know, within John Deere, where they can have these informational interviews with, so they can get some practice, um, just kind of get to know the culture behind John Deere, and just um, know a little bit more about the company before they go ahead and jump in and apply. Absolutely, excellent question. Don't be bashful. Reach out, just like in your in your thing, what you're asking the the mentees or the mentors to do when they come in is to reach out to people that they're interested in talking to. 
and see if they just have a conversation with you. A lot of people at Deer are very open. I mean, they're very open to me now and helping other people grow. Um, one of the guys that hired me, he's uh, uh, from Colombia. He's originally from Colombia, first generation um, immigrant here. And I don't think directly he's a mentor, but he has always looked out for me and kind of like, hey, you need to go in this direction or you need to look at this differently. So I know that he's kind of like grooming me for future growth. There's always somebody out there in your life that's watching you from afar to help you grow. Um, you can probably reach out to people. And a lot of times people that <clears throat> don't know you're coming, they're very impressed by you. They'll end up being the ones to help you the most. So always reach out, don't be shy. Just if you get a no, move on to the next. No's are good because that allows you to stop wasting your time on somebody that's not interested. <laughs> and go on to find a, a yes very quickly. Don't be afraid of failure. Um, hi, Eric. Uh, go yeah. ahead, Yasra. To, in addition to Sarah's point, getting the interview and standing out during that is one step. But in your experience, what do your standout interns do once they're in the inter internship and hmm. they have that position? Going above what is recommended. And I can give a good example. There was uh, one student we hired here to do some web development stuff. And as he was working through that, he kind of realized that the, the back end, like what the website talks to was really outdated and old. And if it was brought up kind of up to speed to new technologies, we would be easily able to expand into other realms. So it wouldn't just be a, a website. Maybe we could bring in a mobile app that can talk to the same back end a lot easier, or you know, a desktop application can talk to this back end a lot easier. And that insight we never thought of before. And turns out like a year later, um, and the intern came back like he was in and out because of school and stuff. He came back and we actually uh, tasked him to, you know, update the back end if he didn't mind. And it kind of paid off because that work is still being used. The work that he did is still being used today at Deer. So really, uh, the whole point of diversity and inclusion is to bring diverse inputs, things that people don't really think about because they haven't been exposed to it. You are exposed to it and it's good to let other people know. Uh, about new new ways of doing things. So essentially, yeah, just, yeah, <laughs> put your best foot forward and always be thinking outside the box. Oh, I have another question as I always do. Um, I know that you talked a little bit about some of the struggles that you kind of uh, went through when you were younger. What advice would you give to your younger self? Oh history 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 was a four-letter bad word to me when i was growing up and i'm i'm seeing patterns now that they're good and they're bad but if if there's a lot of things that i wish i had known then historically i would have made a lot better decisions then uh, so i would have been better off now <laughs> so essentially uh, there's nothing specific but it essentially just learn history it's very important, it's very key to how you do your life and it'll help you go in the right direction a lot sooner than later. Um, I have another question about kind of like the application process for like starting positions is kind of what I'm going through right now. I don't have a lot of experience behind me I'm, I'm only a sophomore, so I haven't had any like internships or anything like that. So um, I guess what is your advice on like selling yourself and your skill set when you don't have um, the solid experiences behind you to back you up? Side projects are always great. Uh, if you can do a project of your own or something that you're passionate about that can express your talent, that goes a long way also. Uh, I hired a freshman intern my second year of, of hiring that turned out to be way better than any master's and PhD student I've ever hired before. So it's not really about the experience all the time. It's really just you know showing that you are passionate about what you want to do and what you're doing and that you can do it even if you haven't got real world experience. Thank you. That's exactly what they did. They hit the this person he was going for a mobile app position, but he this is this was going to be his first real life job. And so he had no other nothing else to do, but he did have a 
couple of projects that he did on the side just to kind of express, hey, this is what I know. You know, we look at the code and it's like he knew what he was talking about and we gave him a chance, gave him an opportunity. Yeah, and, to and, echo off of, and we oh, definitely know talent, talent like yours, we know that you're you're hungry to show how good you are. That's another trade-off when you don't have experience. You want that experience, so your drive is even more than those that already had experience. And echo off of that, where would you kind of search for these side projects if um, some of us don't know where to find them? Uh, my first start would be things that I'm passionate about. So for me personally, if I was to go back, you know, six, 10 years, I don't have a project. One of the things that I'm passionate about is that our family have family reunions every year, well, before COVID. Um, and we have a big family like around the United States. So our family reunions every year bring in about three to 400 people. And a lot of our older people that used to like admin this to get everybody together, they're getting older and they can't really do anything. So why not create some type of app or website where we can do this automate a lot of this stuff for the younger kids to bring a new generation up. So this is a project that for me personally, I could have done to express my skills in mobile development and website development, even without external experiences. So my suggestion would be to look to your passions first, things that you're passionate about and you want to you want to do and get insights to that will give value to somebody else out in the world. Start there. And if you can't find anything there, there are other people that probably got ideas that don't have your skill set. Uh, kind of partner with them and say, hey, I see you're looking for help here. Would you mind if I, you know, kind of get some experience um, doing your project? And they're out there. There's um, boards at the research park where people are looking for help on certain things. Um, Part-time job or internship opportunities are always great. But there are um, boards where people just post and, hey, I need some help with some project or I have an idea for something. Uh, what's the best way to go when you can partner with these people to do that? When looking for one of these projects and you're kind of vocalizing to people that um, you would like to join a project and have some sort of side projects because you don't have time to have, you know, a part time job or summer internship or something like that. Um, I guess, what advice would you give to us to kind of put yourself out there in the position where if somebody has a project that they need help with, they're going to think of you first? Mm. That's a tough one. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if that's possible because there's a, there's a lot of people out there with your talent also. So it's up to the person with the project to kind of choose, you know, who, which one of the unexperienced people will benefit the most. Because again, this, we're speaking of experience as far as work experience. You haven't been out on a real job and done, you know, work with a real company and stuff yet. And that's a tough one. Um, it really, again, may come back to what existing projects can you show that you've done, even if they're personal projects, uh, projects you did for other people before you came out to, or reached out to this person. That may be the biggest deciding factor because everything else is really just paper after that. You know, I, I can write as much accolades about myself as I want, but a lot of times people want to see proof of things. So I think I heard from everybody except for Sherry. Did you, you have any questions? Sorry, I jumped back in the video. I had to move around a lot while listening to you and I didn't want to be distracting. <laughs> so I, I, I am, so mainly for the benefit of the, of the mentees. So I um, had been given a tip. Uh, I don't know that I've been able to use it. I can't remember if I've used it or not, but I know other people that have used this tip with success, an interview tip as a candidate. And you know, you get to that. And at some point in time, you get to the interview process where they're like, do you candidate have any questions for us, right? And sometimes it's just really hard to think of good questions. And, um, but I was really impressed by this one. And I would like to know what you think about this question and um, how it would impact you if you were interviewing candidates, if you received this kind of question. And the question is, when hired, what will I have done in the first six months that would make you happy that you hired me? Um, 
that's a that's a general question. It's a good question. It's general. Uh, oh, okay. It doesn't hurt to ask it. Okay. But but you will definitely put an interviewer on not on the edge. It's something to think about. They won't be able to like answer like that. Think, yeah. They yeah. would have to think. Usually they, they do. Yeah. What I've heard from other people is that the interviewer does pause a minute, but they're usually like, oh, that's a good one. Sometimes like yeah. that. Or and it's pretty bold to start off with when hired. Um, it could be phrased for if hired, but I've heard people um, uh, advocate for the when hired, you know, coming yeah. across. Yeah, I, I'm advocating for when. I like the you when. You advocate when hired. Okay. When hired. Yes. Always. Okay. Anyway, it's, a, it's a sales thing. You assume yeah. the sale. Just assume the sale. Uh, it shows that you really, really want it and you know that you, you're confident in yourself that you're going to get the position. And oh, nothing's wrong yeah. with that. Nothing's wrong with that part. Okay. Nothing's wrong with that. Yeah. As a kind of like a, a icebreaker question, like at the end, and we ask, hey, is there any questions you got for us? It's always a good thing just to kind of learn a little bit personal things about the person. Because when you do get hired, you come back in, you can re still relate more. You already know something personal about the person that interviewed you. So when you're hired, you all, you start in, you'd be like, oh, so I remember you told me about this and, you know, how is that idea. going and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I always think it's really hard to think of. I mean, sometimes it's easy to think of questions to ask, you know, because you've done research on the company, but a lot of times those questions have already been answered by the time you get to the end of the interview. Yes, so. but I, I definitely <laughs> agree. It's good to have a question to ask us because that's part of the interviewing process. We want to keep you, we want to see how fast can you think? Nobody knows all the answers. So right. one of the things I like to do too when I when I hire um, is that there's a lot of times when people have all these accolades on their paper and you don't know if it's true or not. So I actually give them a test also. And the test is set up so that uh, all the answers are one lines. Like they're not long and this is coding. Like these are, these are programming things. So it only takes one line to answer all of these. And the reason we do this, we just want to know that you, if you don't know the answer, how quickly can you go and research and find the answer? Because not everybody has the answer to everything. That's great. Yeah. Don't be ashamed to say you don't know, but show that you know where to go and get the answer mm -hmm. or how to, how to, how you're going to research. What's your process to actually going about finding this answer? Nothing's wrong with that. And that's more valuable than just knowing everything. Yeah, to echo off of that, um, is there or has there ever been a student that you interviewed and then kind of went back to deliberate and said, I want to hire this person right now? Is there anything that um, that student did during that interview or, you know, does a student even exist, I suppose? <laughs> has that ever happened to you? Yes, it has. I, it's been far and few between. Um, one of the things one of the things Deer has an issue with is we prolong the hiring process. And it's nothing that we can do here. It's really just an HR thing. You got to go through this step, that step, and other step. And a lot of times that drive to want to hire this person right now is that we know that there's competition out there for that talent. And if we don't hire them like today, they're gone. Like, don't expect to come back tomorrow and say, okay, we want to hire you. They're, Google already picked them up for 100 mil. So. <laughs> Um, there are times that we, that we get that, um, as far as what quantity, what qualities they presented, uh, it, it was typically always, they really were passionate about their work and they knew it inside and out. There was even a couple of times where, you know, I, I will watch these students do the tests. And they really didn't know about a particular topic or what they supposed to be fixing, but they were able to go and find the answer quickly. And that me personally, I love that. Because we, we run into that all the time. You're going to hit roadblocks that you just don't know. How efficient can you go and find or research the, the answers to that problem? Wow, I can't believe I talked or we've talked for this long. <laughs> well, all the conversation has been really good. And um, I'm definitely learning a lot. Um, I guess when we were having that discussion with Sherry, just talking about, you know, what's the best kind of question to ask post-interview? Something that I've always asked, and please tell me if this is the worst question you've ever heard. Um, but something that I always say is, uh, what characteristics would 
um, an ideal hire for you. And I usually ask my, who my supervisor would be, um, but what characteristics would be best in the person that gets this position? What characteristics would mm. they have? That question, did, they, did people answer that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> they do, yeah. And okay. then usually I would follow up by saying, this is why I have all these characteristics or something like that, or this is how I've shown that throughout the interview. Okay. So there's a little bit of, again, HR behind some of these things that you can and cannot answer. Uh, a question like that at Deere, we probably wouldn't answer because it may show bias to one side or another. In which case, you know, that is putting us in a liable position. Kind of like when I get um, applications, I try not to read the name. I read, I save the name for last, like right when I'm calling the person to set up for an interview, I don't read the name. I try not to look at any of the sex or anything, just go right to like education and experience to kind of see what's going on there. And I go from that point on. Because there's a lot of what ifs can happen, like if you, get biased. Uh, so for that particular question, if viewers at Deer and I was hiring you, I would probably not give you a direct answer. <laughs> yes, that's better than having a bad question, right? <laughs> Correct. And there's no such thing as a bad question. I mean, it definitely have a question. That's not a bad question. Some places will answer that, but it's really up to the companies to decide. Some companies are more, you know, scared than others to ask questions. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. I think we have about seven minutes here. So if anyone wants to get in some last minute questions um, before I kind of ask one more and, and close it off. I do want to say one thing to you before you all go. Like I got my start here in Champaign in front of the research park. The research park has a lot of resources for anything that you need help with. Don't be scared to reach out to anybody over there at that office. Laura, all the way up to Laura Ferrix. Like, know her by name and make sure she know you by name. You need to know that lady. And then the next Laura, all the Lauras, make sure they know you by first name basis because they can they can move mountains for you. They're an awesome team to work with. I will say that when I interviewed Enterprise Enterprise Works, I didn't know about that tricky little question that I shared earlier today, but something that strives to get a similar type of answer. I asked um, in my question group, I asked, what are the top three things that you need this position, this role to tackle as soon as they're hired? So, so things like that, or what problems question. do you need solved? And I think that's just kind of like a salesy person type of asking the question, you know, the other way. And it does make, and, and that put people on pause too. They had to stop and think. I mean, sometimes they stop and think, sometimes they're so desperate, like we need this, this, this. <laughs> how would you go about doing it <laughs> so. no that's an excellent question because it, it actually it actually is kind of like a, a hidden question then they're like what projects are you working on because you can't answer that without actually getting to that and then then you as the person that's being interviewed can kind of again judge is this something that i may want to work on in the future mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so don't forget this is a this is a, a two way negotiation going on here. It's not just you know you wanting to get a job from a company. It's that they want to hire good talent. You know you're just as important in that whole meeting as the person that's interviewing. So you have choices too, and more than likely you you should be having a whole bunch of offers at the same time to review it. Don't just like apply at one place, go there and expect to get it or be bummed out. Go in with like ten different options and you be the deciding factor yourself on if you want to take something or not. Okay, okay, I, re I really oh. enjoyed this. Oh, sorry, Sarah. I just no, you're fine, Sarah. Sarah. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. I really enjoyed listening to this. I didn't always get to watch it because I had some things I had to deal with in the background, um, but I really enjoyed what you share here today. Happy to share it. So Eric, if you could leave us with um, some final words on or kind of action items, that's kind of what I always talk about. Action items being something that's really important that you have to get done, something that you found that really resonated with you um, or some questions or follow-up items that you wanted to do. Um, what kind of action items would you give to our student mentees and student mentors to kind of set them up for a future uh, career in success, starting off really successful? 
Oh, good question. Goals, definitely set goals for yourself um, that are manageable, nothing like too high, too crazy, but things that you can actually achieve on a daily basis, weekly basis, yearly basis. Uh, don't be afraid to reach out to people. Uh, and definitely always, 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 always embrace failure, learn from it and, and go for it. Like, I think the worst thing that we do is we'd be scared to fail and never do anything. Uh, always go out there to do something. If you fail, you fail, make sure you learn from it. That way the next time you do something, you don't make the same mistake. That's the biggest one. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Eric. I think we've all really learned so much from um, your talk with us. And thank you again for coming in and speaking to the mentorship program. Um, although, you know, we're pretty small, we're definitely mighty. And everyone here is really committed to creating um, a really good uh, kind of plan for their future, setting those goals and uh, being super prepared for when they're ready to go out into the job force. So thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. And um, everyone who is here today, please feel free to reach out to Eric, send him an email. Um, I know that some of us were a little bit shy today. So if you didn't feel comfortable saying um, something to Eric, please feel free to send him an email. Yep, and I keep everything confidential. Thank you so much again, Eric, and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Yeah, you all enjoy your day too. Thank you for having me.